Um, and thank you for having AWA Europe. I know that uh, this is really a hot spot for AR, so I'm proud to present to the audience. Um, I expect we'll have a lot of people with sort of a sophisticated understanding of AR. So what I'm going to talk about today is Vuforia's support for Microsoft HoloLens. And I'm sure you've heard about HoloLens. HoloLens is a new technology from Microsoft. It's embodied in a device that enables you to do spatial mapping, positional tracking, gesture recognition, 3D audio, um, and then also uh, voice recognition. So what I'm gonna talk about is how do we support that? And then I'll, I'll give you kind of a brief overview of what the authoring workflow is to develop a, a HoloLens app that is complemented by Vuforia and how you, what, how you can use Vuforia to extend the capabilities of the HoloLens platform. So before I do that though, I'll give you a brief introduction to Vuforia. We'll talk about what kind of experiences HoloLens supports and what it provides. And then we'll get into the authoring workflow. And hopefully I'll have time to do uh, a brief Q&A, question and answer after the session. So before it had come out of an R&D division um, at Qualcomm originally, we are currently a PTC company. But when we'd started, we were an R&D group that really focused on taking computer vision algorithms and building them from the ground up for mobile devices. As you can understand, computer vision is very computationally intensive. And what we focused on is making very robust algorithms that are portable across a variety of runtimes, Android, and iOS, and now Windows 10. And thirdly, to make computer vision as applied to augmented reality easy to use for developers. So we've created APIs and workflows that enable people who don't have a formal background in computer vision or machine learning or some of the other constituent contributing areas to enable them to develop applications um, for augmented reality. And really the SDK that we offer focuses on really natural feature tracking, which is a term you may have heard. But this supports a range of image recognition and also image tracking. These are flat images or images that are wrapped into a known geometry. Uh, we also support object recognition, which is the detection and recognition and tracking of three-dimensional objects that have a stable geometry and have some pattern of feature variation, that there's some detail that we can see. Thirdly, we, we support features like text recognition for Roman characters for English language and um, European languages. And thirdly, we support environmental understanding or environmental reconstruction meaning that we have an ability to reconstruct the physical environment, the geometry of the environment, as a three-dimensional mesh, and then we can return that to you so you can do useful things with it. You can develop games for, I mean, applications for gaming or product visualization, and basically it enables you to apply rendering and physics to a map of the world around you, and that's using a standard device camera. So as I mentioned, we solve a lot of the hard problems that go into developing augmented reality applications. That's enabled a lot of people to come into the area of AR and start developing apps without having a background in CV, without really even having to know anything about augmented reality from the beginning. And what that's enabled is the success of a lot of developers. Over the five years that we've been available, um, we've grown to, I think, 275,000 developers at this point. They have over 30,000 apps in market. Uh, these are in the App Store uh, and Google Play. And that has resulted in over 300 million app installs. So we're responsible for a lot of the, or we, we support a lot of the apps that are currently in the market and have enabled a lot of people to get into AR development um, who may have otherwise been working in interactive development or game development or marketing apps or something like that. So people that are non-specialists. And when you look at the offerings of the Euphoria platform, it's really the SDK which is for Android, iOS, and also UWP. We support mobile devices and tablets. And we also support um, head-mounted displays, which we call eyewear. So these are things like the uh, Microsoft HoloLens, uh, the BT200 by Epson, uh, the ODG R6, R7, and also cardboard and Gear VR. It's a range that is um, both optical see-through, meaning that there's a transparent lens, or video see-through, meaning that you take the device and actually use the viewport of the device to see the world around you. Beyond the SDK, we have a range of tools. 
which are online, largely, we have a target manager. So this is a web-based tool that when you are defining the images that your application may use or the objects, you upload them into the target manager. It provides a data representation that you can then add to your application, or you can also deploy it on a cloud service so that you can query the targets online. So you can either take the targets, put them into your app, or you can query them through a web API or from your device. Beyond the web tools, we support um, object scanning tools for capturing three-dimensional objects, and also calibration applications for the eyewear, meaning that we can gauge the IPD and other features of the geometry of your face so that we can help with the static registration of objects when using an optical see-through head-mounted display. And as I mentioned, we have a range of cloud services. These are supported both from the SDK and also use and they enable you to perform image recognition and also to download what we call a trackable representation of the image. So you can recognize it and you can also then follow it within the viewport, I mean the field of view with the camera, so you can perform augmented reality um, rendering and such onto it. So what I'm going to talk about today is specifically our support for UWP applications and among those, uh, the support for Microsoft HoloLens. So this came out relatively recently. We had traditionally been Android and iOS. When we introduced support for UWP, it opened up the whole world of Microsoft um, devices. And currently we're supporting the Surface and the Spectre devices. And also we have a specific uh, SDK uh, variant that is available for Microsoft HoloLens. And so what this enables us to do is add some features to HoloLens that I'm going to be talking about in a second. But let me just, I think, review what is available from HoloLens by itself, and then I'll talk about how we extend those capabilities. So here's the device, if you haven't seen it. Is this available yet in Germany? Can you buy this in Europe? Okay. Soon, yeah, I, that's what I was gonna mention. I've seen an announcement that it's coming soon. Um, you've been able to get it through the States as a developer kit. They recently opened it publicly, so it, it should be available here soon. Um, some of the recent announcements beyond that is that Microsoft is really offering HoloLens, it has been as a developer kit, and they've begun to extend the I APIs into the Microsoft platform. So they're becoming platform APIs. And I think what that suggests is that you'll have devices like HoloLens in the future, but you may have other parties that are building devices, maybe they're not eyewear, maybe it's a handheld device. But they're generalizing some of the capabilities that I'm going to discuss. So when looking at the HoloLens, I'm not going to break this apart, but I, I have some pictures here, is basically you have the optical system. So this is waveguide optics. There's a projection system that basically projects the image through the lens and it's then diffracted back towards your eyes. And there's a diffraction system in there that basically separates RGB and it provides a coherent um, image, basically projection back to the eyes. I'm not entirely sure of what the full extraction method is for this, but we do know it's waveguide. Um, and I guess some of the takeaways with the display here, if you, if you try the HoloLens, is that the brightness is very good, um, but there is still limited field of view. So the comment that you'll get often is that it's a very good experience, the tracking is exceptional, a lot of the supporting technology is very, very good. Um, what needs to happen, I think, for future adoption is to see the field of view probably increase a little bit. So there's the optical system, complementing that then, is really the sensor fusion um, system that they provide. So HoloLens has an array of cameras and it also has an array of um, IMUs. The cameras, this, uh, the graphic up, or the image up there, is that you have two um, wide field view black and white cameras, which are on the sides. And then there's also a time of flight IR projection system with an IR camera there. So basically what this is providing you, it's supporting both the spatial mapping, as they call it, the reconstruction, which is the active IR scanning technology. And then there's also uh, what I, I think is basically visual inertial odometry. So it's using the, the black and white cameras in combination with the texture map or with, of the reconstruction and the spatial mapping to provide you with a positional tracking solution. When you're using HoloLens and when you're programming for it, a lot of that is abstracted. You, you don't actually have to try to fuse or combine these data inputs or the sensor inputs yourself. It's providing you with basically a, a coherent spatial mapping reference 
and points within that and meshes and also the understanding of your relative position. I'll talk about a little bit, a little more of that later. Um, but I think the thing to take away from here is that the display basically is showing you what is constructed from the sensor fusion system. The sensor fusion system is combining technologies such as depth sensing and also a positional tracking solution. Um, and all of that is processed by what they call the holographic, pro the holographic processing units. They're really a dedicated application specific um, designs in there that deal with the fusion of positional tracking, the reconstruction. It also helps with the gesture system. There's a range of gestures that are supported. But a lot of that is handled through this hardware that's shown here where you have a general sort of processing unit and then you have certain application specific functions that are performed through the HPU as they call it. So what all of this does is provide for what is referred to as HoloLens spatial mapping. Um, this is a reconstruction technique. Basically what it's doing is it's creating 3D meshes of the physical environment around you. There's two primary technologies, two primary capabilities coming from HoloLens, is that you have the spatial mapping, the reconstruction technology, and then you have a positional tracking technology, which I've mentioned. Um, the spatial mapping reconstructs spatial surfaces, and then it brings those all into a world coordinate system. Um, and one of, this is one of the things that we interact with, and anybody who's developing a HoloLens application is working within is really the notion that there is a world coordinate system that the user exists within and also that the specific setting that has been reconstructed exists within. And it's one of the things that enables you to relocalize or return to a given reconstruction, potentially to share them, and also to have a notion of where these exist within the larger world so that as you walk around, whether it's an interior setting or you're moving from place to place, that you have the ability to restore and localize the user in relation to that reconstruction or that, that spatial mapping setting. So when talking about this, just I think to understand um, the world co coordinate system that they're using, it isn't necessarily explicit to the, let's say the starting point of the reconstruction. If I'm standing here and I'm using the device and I'm projecting out onto the world around me, it isn't um, orienting the origin of the world on me. It basically establish it, it establishes the world coordinate, the origin within the reconstruction itself. And to complement that, there's a couple of other techniques that you can use where you can explicitly establish an anchor point for the world, meaning you're saying when I perform the original reconstruction, when I'm generating the map or the mesh of the world, I can choose for a specific point in that to act as the anchor point, and that has uh, special significance within the mapping system, within the spatial mapping system, that it'll use that anchor point as sort of a known um, position, almost like a ground truth. So what you're doing is you can go around, establish anchor points, and it helps to kind of solidify or improve the quality of the tracking that you're using when you render content into that. There's also a coordinate frame that can be attached to the person. So if I wanted to have an object that was augmented in my field of view and I wanted it to follow my body. Let's say almost acting like a head up display or maybe it was a tool that I would bring into the world around me. I can attach it to a, a body coordinate and have it follow me as a relative position and then anchor it into the world. So to, you basically have the spatial mapping reconstruction in a world coordinate system. You can create anchor points within that to act as reference points within the world and then you can also bring things into the world from the body coordinate system and put them into the broader um, world coordinate system. So there are some common scenarios that Microsoft has been working on. You'll notice if you followed HoloLens that a lot of the earlier ones were kind of consumer oriented. It was things like gaming or looking at products in your home or doing something like, uh, you know, visualizing a model on your desk or something like that. What they realized is that there's actually a lot of demand from enterprise and commercial users. And so they've kind of shifted gears where they still have an interest, I think, in having consumer applications, obviously. But they've also found that there's a lot of interest from people that are doing things like step-by-step -step instructions in an enterprise setting. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking at this, it's basic tasks like, as far as use cases, placing content in the world. The meshes themselves can support things like occlusion culling, right? So if you have a mesh of the geometry 
of your setting, you can render content onto it, you can use it for depth masking, and you can also use it for physics simulation. You can apply physics to it, such as um, you know, boundary and collision detection, things like that. And then the other is, is the navigation. So as I mentioned, to complement the spatial mapping, there's a positional tracking system. This is what, aside from reconstructing a mesh of something, enables you to walk around. So the question is, what does Vuforia do that HoloLens doesn't, and how does it help HoloLens? So HoloLens, obviously, it's providing you with a mesh of the geometry of your surroundings. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't separate the surfaces, it doesn't provide segmentation, it doesn't provide a scene understanding, it's not telling you what are the significant planar surfaces, what are the verticals, what are the intersections of surfaces. It's almost like a relief. It's almost that you have a, a point cloud of all of the surfaces around you and then that's stitched together as a polygonized mesh. But again, it doesn't give you any surface segmentation or an understanding of the semantics of the scene or the geometry of the scene itself. Um, so what Vuforia does very well is, as I mentioned, we can recognize images and three-dimensional objects. And when we do reconstruction using our smart terrain feature is we can understand when we're looking at a plane and when the plane is segmented from an object on it and to provide bounding volume. So we can give some intelligence to the reconstruction of the environment um, beyond what the mesh itself is giving you. So this is where we extend hollow is we give HoloLens the ability to recognize images and objects and specifically to know exactly where they are in the environment, within the field of view of the user. So what this enables is that when you're working with HoloLens by itself and you want to position content, when you want to register, let's say, a model or digital content, there's a couple of ways to do it. One that they promote is that you can use the combination of gaze, which basically casts a ray into the environment until it intersects with the mesh, and use that to have the user look at something and then perform a gesture and place it at the intersection where the ray cast is hit, right? Where, which, where's the touch point? But that's very imprecise. You're really asking that someone can sort of navigate and find where they're going to put something. Um, the second case is that when you're creating a, a spatial map, when you're creating this mesh, you can persist it, you can store it. And so what you can do is take that, sort of take it offline, Put content into that. You could even do this wearing the HoloLens. Store those points and then dynamically when the scene is reconstructed, restore the content into that specific location. Um, that's actually a lot of work. So, you know, this is where Vuforia provides a nice capability for HoloLens that you can simply enable someone to take something like a target and put it into the setting and enable them to place content directly onto it. You know where it is and you know what it's going on to. You can say, okay, if I have an image, for example, here, this, the stones target, which is, I'll show this later in the tutorial section, but what you can say is when I see that, I'd like you to put a, a, a teapot onto it or a hat or a rabbit or a car or whatever it would be. And it enables you when you've reconstructed this entire setting to know exactly what you're looking at and where you're going to put something. And you can do that with a variety of different targets. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, this really enables a couple of cases. One is a simple design visualization case, meaning that you want to see something in the real world and you want to have people be able to, let's say, walk around it. It's to do things like design validation, simply design review, potentially. Maybe have multiple people look at it. You could have a collaborative design review. And also, we've seen um, cases where people were taking it up for space planning, let's say. There's a, an example um, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the US. They've been using HoloLens with Euphoria to do space planning within really a mock-up of the space shuttle, like a spaceship. And there's obviously constraints to the space. It's very important that everything is balanced and weighs properly and it's used efficiently. efficiently. So they'll use HoloLens in that setting to be able to visualize where you may place things without having to bring the objects in. So that's basic visualization and just knowing what the dimensions of something are and where it would sit and what it's going to look like. And then the other case is to use uh, the combination of HoloLens and Vuforia so that you're driving tasks, basically. And this is maybe delivering instructions or walking somebody through an inspection process or a step-by-step -step set of instructions for, let's say, disassembling or repairing or, or doing something. So I'm going to show you um, an example of this from the build conference by Microsoft. Uh, this is 
we had worked with, obviously we've been working with Microsoft for a few months now. Um, and we're part of, the, Microsoft sort of regards us as a complement to HoloLens as part of the ecosystem and something that adds new capabilities, as I said. So at Build, they demonstrated the design visualization case. And what they're showing here is having a simple image target that you can see on the table there, and then to take the content and remove it from the target and put it into the real world. So you're transitioning from a known image, a known target with a certain significance, and then you're placing that into the world so that you can walk around it. So hopefully the video will work. Let's see what happens. VR, AR, lots of conversations going on. Um, and so we thought we'd do one demo there. This one's kind of fun for us. The, um, the folks at Euphoria. Let me actually take you a little further. In. Build basically a, a middleware tool toolkit for building augmented reality scenarios. They've got about two. Let me take you back into the deck just so you don't have to watch the whole video again, just for a second. 200,000 plus developers about. No. Anyway, let me, um, hold on one second. Let me just get back in here and do something really quickly. It's about five minutes of video and I won't get through all of it. Here we go. UWP, then by definition it should run on any Windows device, and since it's a 3D model, the next logical thing to do is to run this in HoloLens. You see I'll hold up my um, Surface, and there's that same cat, um, same loader. Now, hi, how are you? Hi, Good Steve. Hi. Hi, Bill. Yep. Um, my brain's gone flat. <laughs> Margo's here to join us, and she's going to help us with the HoloLens version of this now. So what I'd like you to do is, yeah, put on, put on the HoloLens, and she's going to look at that same catalog page and see it from the HoloLens view. So go ahead. So she sees the same model. If you'll notice, even the change note is there. But the cool thing is because she's using HoloLens, she's not tethered then to this piece of paper or the catalog. She can bring this catalog to life. And so why don't you go ahead and bring this, uh, take the loader and go ahead and put it on the stage for us. Great, happy to trigger that animation. So that's what I was just talking about, is it started off with Euphoria. Once it was recognized, we transformed that into the Holland's world coordinate space, and then it enables you to <laughs> And do what's it. unique about this mixed reality experience is that prospective Caterpillar customers can view the Caterpillar at true size and scale, leveraging the existing human and environment understanding API So that's design visualization. Um, and I guess just to sort of provide a little bit of context with this, what they were showing is that when you build a Euphoria HoloLens app in UWP, you're really building 90% of the same application that can go onto the surface. They're really synonymous. There are a few differences with, let's say, maybe the, the UI design that you would use for the HoloLens, some user experience differences. But from an app development perspective, they're really almost the same. Uh, when I go into the tutorial, I'll show some of that. But again, if you're building for the Surface, you've got 85% of what you're going to be using to build for the HoloLens, which is nice because then you can develop portable applications and it provides you this capability, and, but it also gives you a neat um, capability that I'm gonna show you where you can have apps that are multimodal, meaning that someone could start off with a handheld experience and then move it on to the HoloLens when it's useful. So you're not, it's one of the questions I think about digital eyewear or head mounted displays is, is someone really gonna walk around with this on all day long? Is it something that you're supposed to use as a, you know, an appliance to your head or what is this? And I think this is one of the ways of looking at it is at least in enterprise and industrial cases is that it's a tool. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily wear it all the time but you'll wear it when it's useful. And this is one of the cases that we're showing here. This was done with Caterpillar. So it starts off on surface, and then you can see to go into the full diagnostic step, he mount, he puts on the HoloLens, and basically repeats the beginning, but now it gives them a hands free experience that if this was diagnostic and maintenance, you can diagnose the problem, and then you'll, your hands are free to actually do something about it. So those are really the two, the two primary cases that we've developed so far. Um, they've been in conjunction with both Microsoft and with Caterpillar. Uh, Microsoft, I think, has an interest in, in supporting these kinds of applications and really working with third, third parties as solutions providers 
and also as parties that can help them to extend the capabilities of the HoloLens platform. We get the question a lot like, why doesn't Microsoft just do this, or why are they, you know, why haven't they come up with a solution for this? I think a lot of it is that they're focused the capabilities, the, the spatial mapping and the positional tracking capabilities, getting that into a form factor that's useful among devices, having reference designs, integrating it to the platform, but also enabling other parties to start adding value through um, solutions that are potentially a bit worth. So just to recap, uh, Vuforia is enabling HoloLens to uniquely identify images and objects. We know exactly where things are in the environment, so you can register content onto them. You are achieve precise content registration, which is a little bit hard to do with HoloLens in and of itself. And as I get into the tutorial, what I'm going to focus on is the way that we do this is by using really the same workflow that you would use to create a, a standard before the application today. We're leveraging our existing features and our existing APIs, and we're simply applying those to Windows 10 and providing some functionality under the hood that enables you to transform a standard handheld application into a HoloLens application. So that uses something called before extended tracking that I'll talk a little bit more about, our C-sharp APIs and also obviously our Windows 10 um, capability. So the workflow for developing um, a HoloLens app using Vuforia, and I'm gonna focus on the Unity environment, but it's really like a visual authoring workflow, right? So there's not a lot of programming done. There's not a lot of coding unless you really need to customize the behavior of the, of the application. But has, who's familiar with Unity? Does everybody know Unity? Okay, good. Um, for those who don't, Unity is a, originally a game development um, authoring tool, basically. So it's primarily visual development that you then extend using things like scripting. You can add plugins, but most of the work is done within uh, sort of a 3D scene view where you have the subject matter visible to you. Whatever you're working on, you can actually see it. And you work within a scene graph, so it gives you a hierarchy of the scene, and then you're applying, applying custom behaviors to that uh, through scripting. So that's the workflow I'll focus on. When you're doing that, really the steps are really pretty simple. You come in, you'll configure your scene to use augmented reality by using a specific camera that we provide. You add your targets, as I mentioned, these are images or objects that are derived from the target manager tool that I talked about. Basically, you're uploading images, it's processed online, and then you can download what's called a target database or a data set and add that to your application. So that's the representation of the target image that you're going to be using. You'll add those to your project, and then you bring that into the scene, and it's going to be represented visually, so you can actually see what you're working with. And then once you have the target, you'll add any content to that as a child. I'll show you this, but what it means within the scene hierarchy is that you're just dropping it on to the target itself, and that establishes the association so that when the target has been detected by the camera, or by the SDK, and is being tracked, that those basically, the, what happens is the content associated with it is automatically rendered and then moves with relation to the target. So that's how you're developing an AR app, basically. Um, within that, once you have the target and the content, you do any positioning that you need as far as how you want the content in relation to the model. Then you provide the build configuration, which I'll show you, and you build for the Windows Store. So as I mentioned, when you're building a UWP app with before, you really build the same app that you would apply to the Surface uh, can also be deployed to HoloLens. And what demonstrates that is the fact that really both of them are Windows Store's apps. And really it's just what the runtime is that distinguishes really the behavior of the application. So this is a view of the operations that we'll do in Unity. I just want to give you um, sort of an introduction to that. I know sometimes when you get into the Unity environment, it can be a little bit busy. So I'm isolating exactly what we're going to be working on. Um, and also, once this deck is distributed, it'll give you sort of a mini tutorial that you can use to start working on this stuff. But basically, what you're looking at here is the AR camera that you see on the left is the augmented reality camera that's provided by the Vuforia Unity extension. That's the asset that you'll bring in from us to provide AR capabilities within Unity. Um, what you'll do with that is really configure the camera for eyewear. You'll notice we've configured this for optical see-through eyewear. We've set the see-through configuration for HoloLens here on the right. And then we've established that HoloLens camera on the left as the central anchor point 
of the AR camera. We did that by just dragging it over. So the binding there is all just drag and drop. It's all a visual altering workflow. Um, then lower in the scene, you see the view mark. That's the target that we're going to be using. The view mark is that, um, is it hexagonal image on the scene there on the left. And that's something, again, that was created in the target manager. It was downloaded to the project. And then it was configured through this database configuration on ViewMark behavior. ViewMark is, is you can think of it as an as a advanced type of fiducial marker, in a sense. It's a marker type that we've introduced recently where you can actually define the contour for yourself. You can define the geometry. And then you can add a custom image. And you can even define what the shape of the encoding space is. Um, this is of interest to anybody, especially in enterprise and industrial, where you want to have a custom marker, um, but you also need it to support data encoding, right? So I can talk about that later. But you'll see there with the view mark that what I've done, and this is really the most important step, is in blue, I've enabled extended tracking. So this is what enables this app to function as a HoloLens app. Um, and to explain extended tracking, you've probably heard of simultaneous localization and mapping, if you hear. This is a, a technique that enables you to create essentially a map of the world around you. What we do is we take that and we use it to stabilize um, the registration of content within the world. So extended tracking starts from a known target and then it has the ability, once it's activated, to start capturing other features of the environment in order to provide a broader frame of reference, a broader map in which to stabilize the registration of any content provided there. It enables you to take content also and place it away from the target. So it doesn't have to sit exactly on top of it, but it can actually move away and you can actually leave the view of the target and have things retain their registration and placement within the scene because extended tracking is performing this slam-like operation to create a, a larger map of the uh, surrounding environment. So what happens when this is enabled on an application that isn't on HoloLens, if it was just on a handheld device, is it's doing that. It's basically starting with the target and it's creating its own map of the environment in order to provide a stable reference. What happens when we go on to HoloLens is that the same map we've created then is transformed into HoloLens space. And the significance of this is that any Vuforia app on HoloLens starts in Vuforia mode. You can think of it that way. Where we initially recognize the target, the SDK is running, it sees the target, and then it starts building a first impression of the surrounding. It provides an initial mapping of the surroundings, and it provides also an estimate of the pose quality. We look, the pose is the understanding of the position and orientation of the target in space relative to the camera coordinate system. So let's say I was looking at the wall out there. It's trying to provide an estimate of where that wall is as far as the distance from myself and how it's angled in relation to myself. And so we do an analysis for about you know, I think 15 frames, we're really looking at the pose variance, whether it's a quality pose, does it seem stable? Once we feel that we have a quality pose, we take that and we perform the mathematical transformation from our camera coordinate frame into the HoloLens world coordinate frame. This is really the significant thing because what it does for HoloLens is says, look, we've now seen something in the world, we have an original pose that's now, it's been consumed from this camera coordinate frame from Euphoria, and it's been translated into the native coordinate frame of HoloLens. Thereby, HoloLens, the spatial mapping system, knows exactly where to put it. And when it's doing that, it's simultaneously providing its larger mapping um, reference using the active IR scanning, the rest of that, and it's able to situate it within the world. So that's kind of the secret sauce, is that what Vuforia does, it recognizes something, and then it's able to provide HoloLens with a native reference for the position of that thing in the world, uh, where HoloLens otherwise wouldn't have that capability. It doesn't know where something is, and that's the role that we play. So that's what extended tracking does. As you can see, there's really about three steps that are necessary to create an application and just convert it to HoloLens or adapt it to HoloLens. It's very, very simple. Um, the other significant steps are to go into um, the build settings for Unity and configure them for HoloLens. We have documentation on this online. I'm not going to bore you with it, but basically it's setting up for Windows Store, setting it up for HoloLens under the VR SDK, and then enabling these capabilities. You have to enable the webcam and enable the internet client. So look this up. When you have a chance to play with HoloLens, these are exactly the steps that you'll need to perform. So let me go into Unity and I'll show you what I've just done. Hopefully it'll be useful. Um, and we'll talk about some of this. 
So this is the Unity environment. If you haven't seen it before, as I mentioned, oops, actually, let's take that down. What is the, um, excuse me. There you go. This is Unity. Um, on the left is the scene graph that I talked about. So here's the AR camera right here. You can see here is the eyewear configuration. So when you're coming in here, typically what you're going to do is you come to the scene, you add an AR camera, you set that up for optical see-through, you set up your see-through configuration for HoloLens. And then this, if you're used, this is derived from the HoloLens sample. If you use the sample, we have a HoloLens camera that's provided to you. Otherwise, HoloLens is using the Unity main camera, and you would use that instead. If you're starting with the Unity, with the Vuforia HoloLens re reference, the sample, we have the HoloLens camera available. <coughs> I'd recommend looking at that, because it's actually the easiest way to get started. But the AR camera here, again, is set up for HoloLens. It's set up to use the database that contains this view mark, and to also activate that at runtime. And then the view mark, all of these are available through the Vuforia folder and prefabs. Again, this is what you're going to see after you've imported either the sample or our extension. We provide you with all of these prefabs and components as a package, and they're just brought into your project. So you would drag the AR camera into the project. You would drag the view mark into the project. You configure them, right? The view mark here, again, has, we need to enable extended tracking on that right there. That's what enables you to use it for HoloLens. And then the other significant thing to look at is that when I have content in the scene, like this filter, this was actually from the demo you'd seen where the worker comes up and starts with the surface and then goes under the HoloLens. This is the same content. But basically, you'll notice that the filter has simply been added as a child of the view mark. So because it's a child, it's now in the local coordinate space of that target, and thereby when the target is recognized or when it's being tracked, it's going to follow that, and it'll be rendered with the motion of the target itself. So that's really all you're doing. The other significant steps here are to go into build settings, set it up for Windows Store, set it up for Windows 10. You don't have to worry about the build type, really. Um, and then when you go into player settings, you'll see here that we need to enable, let me find these. Enable virtual reality, enable Windows holographic as the VRSDK, and then in published settings, there are a few capabilities that you want to enable. Um, the webcam is significant. Really, when you're using before you with HoloLens, it's using what they call the PV cam, and it's a center camera that they really, I think, have thought of people using as a webcam, like you're taking pictures of the world around you. That's the camera we use. So you need, need to enable the webcam. And then if you're using things like voice commands, you'll enable the microphone, you can also enable their spatial perception, which opens up additional APIs to do some of the spatial mapping. Um, but again, that's it. And then you build and run, or you build. It'll create a Visual Studio project for you, and then you just build and you, you basically install it on the HoloLens. So it's a very, very simple workflow. I, I think we're getting close. Do we have any questions? You mean to, to develop an app that would, so they're not going to run on a HoloLens, but you're saying to, to, it's actually not, so this is, yeah, I would say the, basically you could create the same application in Unity and just change the platform. What we've seen with the iWare, like what I mean is in build settings, you go and just select Android or iOS versus Windows Store. Um, Really, the big difference is that when you get into things like the UI elements, like what is any, any you know, UX that you're presenting, any whatever, is you have to position them correctly so that they're converging for the user's eyes. That's the big challenge in getting into any, anything that goes from a single viewport into a stereo viewport is handling the UI elements correctly. There are some other things like, um, just as a basic rule of thumb, is when you're looking at targets, for example, when you have a handheld device, the user obviously has the ability to move their hands. If they have it on their head, they have to move their head. So if you have something that's too far away or too small, it can be, it can be uncomfortable for a user to try and position themselves to it. So you may find that you want to adjust some of the, like the parameters of the user experience. You're adjusting maybe the target size, things like that. So the UX is a bit different, UI elements are different. Otherwise, it's like inputs, where 
you can touch a screen on a device, but you're not touching your eyes or something. So you need to adapt it maybe for gestures or for voice. That's really the big challenge. Yeah. Yes, that's an interesting, because this has proven to be uh, the bane of my existence, is that the, it's creating a map of the environment, right? It has a set of meshes, and as I, I sort of mentioned, is that you can apply, apply physics simulation to that. So what that demo actually does is that it's applying, I think, rigid body physics to the Caterpillar tractor. So really, all she's doing is releasing it into the air, and then it falls. That's how she's positioning that. So that's one way of doing it. The challenge is if you've reconstructed something like the edge of the stage and you place it the wrong, in the wrong position, it actually falls over, right, which isn't desirable. The other way of doing it that's recommended by Howlands is using gaze. So they have a sense, basically, what they're doing is ray casting from, I think, the assumed center of the user's eyes out onto the mesh and then where it collides with the mesh it establishes a point, and you can use that pose to place content. Yeah, I think that's how they do it. Yeah, so we, uh, there's actually a couple of, we have an API to control that, but I think the recommended practice is that once you, once you transition, that you turn it off. Otherwise, you're just, it's overhead to try and keep processing that. It, so it is, autom let's, how would I describe this? It's automatic by default unless you choose to restore it. So imagine that when it transitions, it turns off automatically, but then you can turn it back on. You can reset it, essentially. So no, what you're looking at is, again, there's different behaviors that can be configured. Really, by default, what you're doing is that it recognizes the image, turns on extended tracking, and then analyzes the frame, transitions to Holland's. When that happens, you're no longer tracking the image. So it effectively, you could move the target away, and it's still going to be in the HoloLens space. If you turn on, before you're tracking again, it'll try to recover. It'll, what it'll do, if I can show you, is let's say that you have the target here. Right, and I start up, I see it, it says, oh, here's the hand, and now I could move the hand, and I still have my content here. But if I choose to turn on the before you tracker again, it'll put it back onto where the target is. So you have some options. We don't actually recommend to try to do tracking of motion on the image, so it's not as smooth as it would be. Really, I think the use that I would recommend is to use it to, again, recognize things and just place them somewhere. And then in the future, we'll have an ability to enable you to do this. But it's currently, it, it needs a little bit of additional work. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, theoretic. I mean, so once the, what, I guess, what's the use case? What are you thinking? So you can. This, that's sort of what I was getting at is, Currently, we're in um, what's effectively a beta, and we're supporting this case of recognition and, and then transition into HoloLens, where you could turn off extended tracking and maybe reacquire poses with the motion of the target going forward. Um, just as I said, I think you need a little bit of work, but for a real-world application, we're probably, I don't know that it's a recommendation. Yeah, definitely. So that's something that they like to point out. What you would do is you could take the mesh, you could even sort of cut out regions of it using, let's say, computational geometry, something like that, um, and then apply depth mask. So you could do that. Thank you very much, David. We're thank running you. out of time. So uh, let's thank David. <laughs>